software components are an important part of all types of software development, and they're especially useful in embedded software. In this video, we'll look at three types of software components. First, the state machine. Many embedded systems are reactive systems that respond to events from the environment and generate events to manipulate the environment. We can use software state machines to implement these reactive systems. This kind of state machine is different from the kind of state machine that you may have used in hardware. It's event driven. There's no clock that determines exactly when the inputs are sampled. The system changes state when an input event is received. The state machine keeps that internal state as a variable. Here's a state diagram for a simple state machine that turns on a buzzer if someone in a car sits down in a seat but doesn't click the seat belt on within a certain amount of time. We use a timer to determine the amount of time between when the person sits down in the seat and when they have to click the seat belt. We use a simple pressure sensor to determine when they've sat down in the seat. This machine has four states. In the idle state, no one is in the seat. When someone sits down, it moves into the seated state. If the person puts on the seat belt before the timer goes off, the state machine goes into the belted state. If instead the person doesn't turn on the seat, if instead the person doesn't click the seat belt, the timer will go off and the state machine will go into the buzzer state. Let's assume that eventually the person puts on the seat belt, so the state machine goes into the belted state. When the person gets out of the seat and the pressure sensor is released, the state machine goes to the idle state. Here's C code for an event-driven state machine for this specification. We've shown only two of the states here. You can see that a switch statement is used to check the current state of the state machine. Based on that state, it then may look for certain inputs and depending on the state, set certain output values. You can put this switch statement inside a loop that repeatedly causes it to be executed, thereby checking the inputs and determining when the machine needs to change into a different state. Circular buffers can be used to build filters that are important to signal processing and control. We can use circular buffers in many different applications that require us to process streams of data. The stream goes on for a very long time, but we only process a few samples of the stream at any one time. So in our data stream on top of this slide, at time t1, we use four samples, x1, x2, x3, and x4. Our circular buffer has four entries, one for each of these values. At the next time sample, we still use x3, x4, and x5. At the next time, t2, we no longer need x1. We use x2, x3, and x4, and we add a new value, x5. Rather than move around elements in the circular buffer, we'll simply replace x1 with x5. On the next time step, when we are no longer using x2, we can replace that with x6, which will be the next sample. Here's C code that performs the circular update required to manage this circular buffer. The position of the head of the circular buffer moves in a circular fashion. When we get to the end of the buffer, we wrap around back to the beginning. We have code to calculate the next position that checks whether we're at the end of the buffer, and if so, wraps around. This code then takes the argument, which is the new value, and puts it in to the new position. Here's some C code to initialize the circular buffer, and here is a function to get the value at the ith position. Notice that we use a modulus operator to translate the index for our current set of data into the buffer position.
we can use this code to build an FIR filter, which is a common type of filter used in digital signal processing. In this diagram, each Z-1 box represents a stored value. So this FIR filter uses the current value, three previous values, performs multiplications with coefficients, and then adds together the partial products. Here's a piece of code to update the state of the circular buffer for the FIR filter. Here's the complete FIR function itself. Notice that we're using our circ get function in order to access the data values for computing each filter output. Now if you remember, we talked about digital signal processor architectures that have specialized addressing modes that, that implement circular buffers directly. This code doesn't require the use of a specialized addressing mode. So we, now we have a high level language function that performs the efficient data operations required to build circular buffers and to implement FIR filters using them. An IIR filter, or Infinite Impulse Response Filter, is another form of digital signal processing filter, more complicated structure, but once again, it uses the Z-1 stored values along with the current value, multiplies by coefficients, and adds partial products. Here is code for the IIR filter in C. It also uses the circular get function and circular update. Systems that have variable rates of input and variable rates of processing require queues. This system has two processing tasks, P1 and P2, that are connected by three queues, Q1, Q2, and Q3. This type of arrangement is known as a producer-consumer system. P1 produces values that are then consumed by P2. The number of elements in each queue depends upon the activity in the system. So Q1 may have three elements, while Q2 has one, and Q3 has two. Consider, for example, the dashboard of a car. The driver presses different buttons at different times, and that will determine how many events are generated that must be processed by the system. Here's C code to initialize our queue. We now need two pointers, one for the head and one for the tail. The amount of data determines the distance between the head and the tail. But as with the, but as with the digital filter, we move the pointers around circularly. Here's C code for the NQ function that we use to add a new value to the queue. So we're increasing the amount of data in the queue. But as with the FIR filter, we need to move the pointers around circularly. So when we get to the end of the queue, we will move back around to the start of the queue. Here's C code for the DQ function that removes a piece of data from the queue. Once again, we update the pointers in a circular fashion. Because the amount of data can vary, we want to also implement two checks. We want to know if the buffer is full and we're trying to add more data to a full buffer. We also want to know if we're trying to remove data from an empty buffer. To summarize, software state machines can be used to build event-driven systems. Circular buffers can be used to build filters for signal processing and control. Systems with variable input and processing rates can be built using queues.